original document that we've now found in this new production that relate to those individuals who filed motions to quash. And what I propose is we look at the documents, we figure it out, talk to the proponents' counsel, see if we can work out an arrangement that will allow us simply to move them into evidence without these individuals having to come and testify. As a consequence, you may be able to handle this matter between yourselves. In short, yes. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. And so we'll be in touch, and then if we need to come back, we can do it Tuesday. But we'll try and work it out. All right. If you need to come back, alert the counsel and let the clerk know when you need to see us. We'll take care of it. Thank you, Your Honor. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's see. We're ready, I believe, with the next witness. And you indicated who that witness is and who's going to be presenting. Ms. Redigan? Dan Aiken. D-A-N-A-K-E-N. All right. Please call your witness. Plaintiffs and defense lawyers, I'm Paul Hunter. I do. My name is Edmund A. Egan. Good morning, Dr. Egan. I'm going to publish a slide that summarizes, is a simple demonstrative slide of some of your credentials. And then we'll talk about those. Dr. Egan, what is your current position? I'm the chief economist in the Comptroller's Office in San Francisco. And what is your role, briefly, in that position? I direct the Office of Economic Analysis, which is a division within the Comptroller's Office, and it's responsible for preparing economic impact analysis of pending legislation. Dr. Egan, we'll talk more about that experience and that role in a little while, but tell me a little bit more about your prior professional experience in the area of urban and regional economic policy. Immediately before joining San Francisco, the city and county, in 2007, I worked for a consulting firm known as ICF International, where I did a number of consulting projects related to economic development strategy and analysis in North America and globally. Can you give me a couple of examples, Dr. Egan? In the late 1990s, for example, I worked on the economic development strategy for the city of Toronto. And just before joining San Francisco, I worked as a consultant on the city of San Francisco's economic development plan. Have you ever taught at the university level, Dr. Egan? Yes, I have. And can you tell me about that experience, please? I'm currently an adjunct faculty member at the University of California at Berkeley. I teach city and regional planning, and I teach in the city and regional planning department at that university. Teach undergraduates, Dr. Egan? I teach graduate students. And speaking generally, what kinds of courses do you teach graduate students at UC Berkeley? I teach in the field of regional economic development in the city and regional planning department. Since fall of 2004, each fall I've taught a course called the Urban and Regional Economy, which is a review of a theoretical review of key themes in urban and regional economics to master's and Ph.D. students. Do you have any academic articles that you've published? I've published three peer-reviewed academic articles when I was in graduate school and also subsequently as a consultant. Do those articles deal with the field of urban and regional economic analysis, economic policy? Yes, all of them did. And can you tell me what's the highest level of education that you've received? I have a Ph.D. degree. Where did you receive your Ph.D. degree? From the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Egan, there is a binder in front of you, but there should be, so let me correct that. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Yes, you may. Good 
Regan, would you take a look at the exhibit marked PX2324 behind the tab so marked? Do you recognize that document, Dr. Egan? Yes, I do. What is that document? Uh, that's my CV. Your Honor, I would move that Exhibit 2324, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2324, be moved into evidence. Okay. Very well. 2324 is admitted. And Dr. Egan, that CV represents accurately your professional and academic experience? Yes, it does. Let's talk a little bit more about your role as Chief Economist in San Francisco. You told me that you direct the Office of Economic Analysis. What does that office do? Uh, our local legislative body, the Board of Supervisors, receives all legislation that's introduced by the mayor or by members of that board. And my office reviews that legislation after each meeting uh, to determine if any of it would have uh, a material economic impact on San Francisco. And if we make the determination that it would, we report on that, leg on that impact, detailing the extent of the economic impact before the board acts on that legislation in committee. So what is the intent of those reports with respect to the board's action in committee? It's to ensure that the Board of Supervisors has a full understanding of the economic uh, impact of the decisions they make. How is it that you and your office decide whether a piece of pending legislation could have a material economic impact? Uh, well, there are a number of things that we look for. Uh, among them uh, uh, are um, in the legislation uh, that it has a real regulatory power, that it actually affects the behavior of individuals in, in the city and economic agents such as businesses. And uh, we trace through how the legislation would constrain their behavior and how that would change their economic uh, um, activity um, and then try and, and quantify that. Uh, it, as a general rule of thumb, uh, if we believe that legislation would have greater than a $10 million impact on the city's economy, we would report on that. And when you say you would report on that, is there a product or a written report that you produce? Yes, we prepare written reports as well as do verbal presenta oral presentations of our findings. And what kinds of sources of information do you rely on in preparing those economic, what are they called, those reports? Economic impact reports. And what sorts of sources do you rely on in preparing economic impact reports for the Board of Supervisors? Uh, we're greatly reliant on government statistical data from the state and from the federal governments. We also, I believe in almost every report, rely upon data generated by city departments um, to make quantitative estimates of the impact. We also rely on um, information that's provided from us from uh, um, uh, people who work in the city, sometimes people who work in the private sector in San Francisco and others. And do you rely on research generally beyond the data sets that you described? Yes, we do rely on research uh, other than the, the data, uh, particularly when it pertains to similar legislation or similar issues occurring in other places. And Dr. Egan, these economic impact reports, are they documents concerning urban economic policy speaking generally? Yes, they are. Relied on by the San Francisco Board of Supervisors? That's correct. Your Honor, I would tender Dr. Egan as an expert in urban and regional economic policy. Very well, voir dire. Uh, I beg your pardon? No. No voir dire. Well, very well, and you accept uh, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Dr. Egan as a, an opinion witness in the field for which he's been designated, correct? Yes. Very well. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Egan, let's turn now to your work in the context of this case. And I want to ask if you have undertaken an analysis of the effects of the prohibition, the marriage of same-sex couples, on San Francisco's economy and its governmental costs and revenues. Yes, I have. And Dr. Egan, tell me, is that analysis that you undertook similar to or different from the kinds of analysis that you do as chief economist for San Francisco? It's quite similar to the kinds of analysis we do in our daily work. The only difference being is that we don't normally review state legislation. We only review city legislation. 
And when you considered that analysis, did you look for positive as well as negative economic impacts that the prohibition might have? Well, I think you look for impacts. You look for ways in which the regulation affects people's behavior. Whether that winds up being positive or negative uh, uh, is kind of an analytical conclusion. Speaking generally, did you reach any conclusions after undertaking that analysis? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I've identified several ways in which uh, the prohibition uh, uh, of marriages of same-sex couples would have a negative economic impact on San Francisco and also negatively affect the city's revenues and overall budget. And can some of those conclusions about the negative economic impact on San Francisco and its budget and revenues be generalized to other jurisdictions? I believe that they could, uh, although I haven't specifically studied other jurisdictions. Okay. Let's uh, turn now to some specific areas uh, where you, I believe you have opinions. And I'd like to pull up a demonstrative slide. Great. Dr. Egan, do you have any opinions concerning the relationship between the prohibition on same-sex marriage, wealth generation, and city revenue? Yes, I do. Generally, what is that conclusion? Um, <clears throat> in general, because of the ways in which marriage affects uh, people's patterns of wealth generation over their, their life, uh, if um, same-sex marriage were legalized, San Francisco would see an increase in uh, sales tax revenue and an increase in property tax revenue in the future. Using this demonstrative, can you explain to me the relationship between legalizing marriage and the increase in married couples? Yes. Uh, if uh, marriage among same-sex couples were legalized, I predict we would see an increase in the number of married couples in San Francisco. Uh, there is a significant amount of research in economics that looks at the um, impact of marital status on wealth accumulation over the life of an individual. And to put it simply, what it finds, in, in, as I understand it, is that married couples are uh, Tend to, married individuals tend to accumulate more wealth than single individuals. So to the extent that there are more married people and fewer single people in San Francisco, we would see greater wealth accumulated within the city. Dr. Egan, what are the impacts of that greater wealth accumulation within the city on San Francisco? Uh, they have two main impacts. Uh, people with higher wealth tend to have higher income as that wealth generates dividends. That leads to higher spending on consumer goods in San Francisco. Um, it also would tend to uh, uh, increase the value of real estate within San Francisco as we would have more wealth essentially bidding for the same amount of land. And what are the impacts on San Francisco's budget or revenues? Well, higher consumer spending in San Francisco from a wealthier population leads to an increase in sales tax revenue since the city uh, gets a percentage of all consumer spending in the city and greater value of real estate in San Francisco leads to an increase in property tax revenues because we also get a percentage of uh, uh, the assessed value of each property. Dr. Egan, is there any way you can tell us about the magnitude of these potential impacts? Uh, not in any strong quantitative sense. Uh, we would need to project over time first what the increase in married couples would be, uh, which might not be that challenging, but projecting the increase in wealth accumulation and how much that would translate into spending uh, is a challenging exercise. I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it's challenging. And you've not attempted to do so here? I've not attempted to do so here. To the extent that San Francisco sees an increase in sales tax revenue and property tax revenue, uh, is that also an impact that you would expect other jurisdictions within California to also see? Um, other jurisdictions within California would actually benefit simply from the San Francisco effect. For example, the state of California gets a percentage of the sales tax that is generated within San Francisco, and other local government entities get a percentage of the property tax revenue. Dr. Egan, let's turn now to the next slide. And this is a demonstrative concerning, uh, it's entitled Healthy Behaviors and Impact on City Revenue. Do you have an opinion about the relationship between marriage, healthy behavior, and San Francisco's revenue? Yes, I do. Uh, my opinion is that legalizing same-sex marriage would encourage healthier behavior, and that would ultimately lead to higher payroll tax revenue and a reduction in public health costs in, in San Francisco. 
You've already explained to us the increase in married couples that you project. Um, what relationship do you see between an increase in married couples and increased healthy behavior from individuals? Um, there is also a number of uh, articles in, in the economics literature that look at the connection between marital status and, and healthy behavior and essentially finding that uh, married individuals are healthier on average and in particular um, uh, behave themselves in healthier ways than single individuals. Uh, that has economic consequences of two kinds. Uh, How about those consequences, please. Certainly. The, um, uh, there is also a, a well-known connection in economics between health of the workforce and workforce productivity, uh, which takes many forms in practice, the simple of which is uh, lower rates of absenteeism due to illness. Higher workforce productivity affects workers' wages through the marketplace, and that directly ties to a local tax revenue we have in San Francisco, our payroll tax. So the more wages that are earned in San Francisco, the more payroll tax that's earned by the city and county. So there's a general link between worker productivity and an increase in payroll taxes? Uh, yes, there is, via higher wages. Higher productivity leads to higher wages. Higher wages leads to higher payroll tax. Yes, I'm sorry. Higher productivity leads to higher wages, and higher wages leads to higher payroll tax revenue for the city. Uh, healthier behavior is also associated with less reliance on uh, the health care system, including the public health care system. Uh, and therefore, to the extent that the population of San Francisco adopts healthier behaviors over time due to marriage, uh, the city's public health care costs would decline, and that would result in, result in a cost savings for the city and county. What is the magnitude of the city's spending on public health, in your understanding? Um, the city's general fund contribution to public health is in the neighborhood of $360 million, $364 million, I think, dollars per year. Dr. Egan, can you tell us how great a savings we would see if we lifted the prohibition on same-sex marriage with respect to public health? Uh, I've not attempted to quantify this either because some of the same challenges, uh, taking an, an estimate of the number of married couples and translating that into healthier behavior and the specific connections between productivity and less demand for health care are challenging to quantify. I think that they could be quantified, but I've not attempted to do so. Yes. Dr. Egan, um, you also explained the relationship between payroll tax and productivity along with the reduction in public health costs, would either of those impacts be seen by other jurisdictions in California, in your view, if the prohibition on the marriage of same-sex couples were lifted? Um, relatively few jurisdictions in California have a payroll tax. Uh, however, many jurisdictions do have a business tax, and to the extent that higher worker productivity results in uh, stronger business performance, which I think is a very reasonable assumption to make, uh, that would lead to higher business tax revenue for those jurisdictions. I want to ask you whether you are aware of any relationship between increased healthy behaviors and domestic partnership. I have not seen any research on that subject. Well, would you assume with me for a moment that domestic partnership has the same effect on healthy behavior as marriage does? Um, and then assume further that domestic partnership is an option for same-sex couples, but marriage is not. Would we still expect to see this impact on city revenue simply from having domestic partnership? I think that you would see an impact on city revenue, but it would not be uh, as great as it would with uh, if same-sex marriage were legalized. And uh, the basis for that opinion uh, is that I believe, based on what I've reviewed in the way of the research, that um, more individuals would select marriage, more same-sex couples would elect to be married than would elect to register as domestic partners. And so those benefits would essentially affect a greater number of people, and you would have a larger number of people in San Francisco who would be benefiting from healthy behaviors or in an institution that promotes healthy behaviors would expect a greater impact on San Francisco's budget or revenue or spending from marriage rather than domestic partnership. That's correct. Dr. Egan, let's look at another aspect of your opinions about health. 
Have you looked at the relationship between the uninsured population, the prohibition on marriage, and the city's expenditures? Yes, I have. And can you tell me what that relationship is in your view? Yes. Uh, essentially, uh, legalizing same-sex marriage would uh, ultimately increase the number of people who had health insurance in San Francisco, and that would reduce the cost of the city and county serving the uninsured, which would result in cost savings for the city and county. And what is your basis for believing that legalizing marriage would cause more companies, would reduce the number of uninsured people and cause a greater health insurance coverage in San Francisco? Uh, in my opinion, if uh, same-sex uh, marriage were legalized, uh, um, uh, same-sex couples would elect that option, and companies, more companies would extend benefits to those couples as married couples uh, than do currently. Um, that would reduce the number of uninsured people in San Francisco, as at the moment there are individuals in San Francisco who are in same-sex partnerships. Uh, where their partner is covered and they are not covered. Uh, their partner is covered by employer health care and they are not. If that number of people was reduced, that would be less uninsured people in San Francisco and that would reduce the local burden on covering the uninsured. Dr. Egan, can you take a look at the tab marked PX2260 in your binder, please? Sorry, the number again is P 2260, Your Honor. Thank you. Would you just review that and let me know whether you've ever seen that document before? <clears throat> yes, I have seen it before. And in what context did you see this document, Dr. Egan? Well, this document was provided to me a few days ago by Greg Sass, who's an official in our Department of Public Health in San Francisco. Is Mr. Sass someone with whom you regularly communicate as chief economist about um, analysis that the Office of Economic Analysis is performing? I've spoken to Mr. Sass before and he's, he's the type of uh, official who, with whom I would regularly talk about uh, issues concerning his field. Um, Your Honor, I move PX2 to 60 into evidence. Uh, Your Honor, we object. This is not a document that was considered by Dr. Egan in his expert report. Your Honor, this is a document that did not exist at the time Mr. Egan was preparing his expert report. It was something that we received a few days ago, and it's merely illustrative of his opinion. When did you, when did you produce this to the uh, proponents? It was produced shortly after we received it, I believe a couple of weeks ago, and it was also disclosed, um, I believe, on Sunday night as a document that we were going to use in examining Dr. Egan. Anything further, Mr. Patterson? Uh, yes. Yes, also, uh, Dr. Egan. Uh, Dr. Egan, they never submitted a supplemental declaration from Dr. Egan saying that he was going to um, consider this document as part of his opinions, and we have no way of determining uh, whether or not it's authentic. We have not laid a foundation for it. Um, don't know where they where Greg Sass obtained the document. Well, let me reserve on that. Uh, let's have the witness lay some additional foundation. Um, I gather you were provided a copy of this document uh, Sunday evening. Uh, yes. Since the document appears to have been created on December 30, 2009, uh, would have been hard to produce much before then. So, in any event, let's see where this goes, and we'll uh, uh, we'll make a ruling uh, after some additional foundation is laid. Yes, Your Honor, Dr. Egan, let's talk a little bit about this document and see if we can satisfy the concerns. Uh, in your understanding, what is the effect of this letter that purports to be sent by the National Elevator Industry? Where did it come from? And foundation. foundation. Okay. Foundation. Well, you re you s you've shared with us that you received it from Greg Sass. Is that correct? That's correct. Did Dr. Sass give you, or Mr. Sass, I'm not sure of his degree, give you any information about the document when he provided it to you? Um, 
He did not. Uh, uh, he emailed it to me and did not provide any additional information beyond the fact that it might be important for, for me to consider in my testimony. And did he give you any reasons why it might be important for you to consider? Uh, no, he did not. Had he previously given you information in the course of um, helping you prepare for your testimony? Yes, he did. What information did he previously provide you? He answered a number of questions I had about the extent of uh, San Francisco's uh, investment in public health or expenditures on public health, and in particular its um, uh, uh, expenditures on the uninsured, if I recall. So assuming that this letter illustrates something about testimony that you're giving today, um, is that the kind of information that you would regularly rely on, information provided to you from department officials in preparing economic impact reports for the San Francisco Board of Supervisors? Yes, it is. Your Honor, I would offer this under uh, Rule of Evidence 703. It simply is helpful to the expert's uh, testimony. It's helpful to his opinion, and it's certainly not prejudicial in any way to uh, proponents. Anything further, Mr. Patterson? Uh, authentic document or where it came from beyond him receiving it from Greg Sass. All right. Well, I'll admit it for what value it has. Um, it appears to be a national elevator industry benefit plan description. Um, the connection to these proceedings is a little uncertain in my mind at the moment, but let's see if you can tie it up. I think I could do that in one question, Your Honor. Frank? Dr. Egan, what, in your view, is uh, the import of this letter with respect to the issues we've been discussing concerning uninsured same-sex partners in San Francisco? It's my understanding that this document details uh, a change in policy by a national elevator industry insofar as it treats same-sex spouses as far as um, benefits are concerned. And specifically, they are, they are detailing that they have changed their policy which used to be that same-sex spouses were not covered because a spouse referred only to a person of the opposite sex who is husband or wife, and they have removed that reference to a person of the opposite sex and now in offer benefits to any spouse. Do they offer benefits to domestic partners, assuming the information in this letter is correct? There's nothing in this letter in reference to domestic partnership. Does this illustrate the phenomenon we were just discussing, that companies typically will offer some benefits to married partners, but will not necessarily offer those benefits to domestic partners. Yes, I believe it does. Okay. Let's go back to this analysis then. Um, in your opinion, we have more companies extending benefits to same-sex partners under a marriage regime. And what, what is the import of that for San Francisco? Well, if more individuals are covered by their spouse's uh, employer health care plan, uh, that would reduce the number of people who are uninsured in San Francisco. And that would essentially reduce the burden of the city and county of San Francisco to provide health care to the uninsured. Dr. Egan, can you tell us how much that burden will be reduced if marriage were legal for same-sex couples? That's a difficult thing to quantify because we don't precisely know how many individuals right now are in that category where they are in a same-sex uh, relationship, they're unmarried, uh, and one partner is covered and the other is not. Um, so we don't kind of know where, what that universe looks like, and so we don't know how many people would be out of that situation if they were able to be married. Do you know anything about the denominator, the size of the potential pool of dollars that are affected? You know that the city and county spends about 175 million, 177 million a year on um, uh, providing health care for the uninsured. And it's your opinion that that would be reduced if more people had health insurance? That's correct. Dr. Egan, can you tell me anything about whether other local governments in San Francisco could see the same effect? You mean other local governments outside of San Francisco? Thank you. Yes. Uh, I, I sometimes take the San Francisco-centric view, but please tell me about that. 
I think this uh, this principle would work um, uh, more broadly than in San Francisco. I mean, for example, I just noticed that national elevator industry from this document is based in Pennsylvania. Uh, this is not simply a San Francisco um, centric thing that companies would provide benefits to all married couples. Um, and therefore, you would see this reduction of the uninsured uh, uh, throughout the country. And what what is the role in, within California, at least, of local governments in providing health services to the uninsured? Um, I'm not sure I can speak to their precise statutory role, but I know that every county in California provides extensive services to the uninsured, and the state funds a great deal of that. Look at some other health and health spending impacts. I've put up another demonstrative concerning behavioral and mental health services. And I'd like you to tell me if you have an opinion about a, a relationship between spending on behavioral health services and the prohibition on same-sex marriage. Uh, yes, I do. What is that opinion, Dr. Egan? I believe that if uh, marriage among same-sex couples were legalized, uh, the city over the long term would see a reduction in its cost for providing behavioral health services and the physical health services that can be allied to that. Okay. Let's talk about the basis for that opinion. I see here a connection between legalizing marriage and reduced discrimination against, I assume the LGBT is lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. Is that correct? That's correct. What's your basis for believing that there is such a relationship? Um, I believe uh, that uh, uh, prohibition of marriage of same-sex couples is a form of um, discrimination, and I believe that it's reasonable to assume that if that prohibition were released, were, were uh, removed, there would be over time a lessening of the discrimination that those individuals experience uh, in society in their daily lives. And assuming that to be true, what is the relationship between reduced discrimination and public health spending on behavioral health services? Uh, when I was preparing my report, I, I spoke with an individual in the public health department who talked to me about the um, uptake of behavioral health services uh, by gay and lesbian people in San Francisco. And I was told that their use of these services is disproportionately high, and one of the reasons for that is discrimination. Consequently, I believe that if the discrimination they experience was lessened, their disproportionate use of these services would be lessened, and that would ultimately reduce in a, re, result in a cost savings for San Francisco. Can you tell us how big that cost savings would be? Uh, it's quite challenging uh, because how much of the additional demand is due to discrimination is hard to quantify. We also don't know exact, the exact amount uh, that uh, gay and lesbian individuals um, uh, require of the city's behavioral health services. One thing we do know is that the city spends $2.5 million a year on specialized services for LGBT populations, um, but that doesn't consider the use by gay and lesbian people of all of the general uh, non-specialized services within um, behavioral health in San Francisco. And what is the size of the potential public health expenditure that we're talking about in San Francisco? Again, the city spends around $360 million a year on public health. Would other jurisdictions see a similar effect, if you were correct, about the effect that San Francisco would see? Uh, in proportion to their gay and lesbian population and to the extent that they also see disproportionate use of those services because of discrimination, I would expect to see that in other jurisdictions, yes. Okay. Let's talk about school funding for a moment. Um, do you have any opinion about the relationship between the prohibition on marriage and the impact of that on local school district funding? Yes, I do. What is that opinion, Dr. Egan? Uh, in my opinion, if uh, the marriage of same-sex couples were legalized, uh, we would see an increase in school district revenue uh, in San Francisco and potentially in other jurisdictions in California. But let's talk first about um, how that relationship occurs using this slide. You, you've 
got, again, this relationship between legalizing marriage and a reduction in discrimination against LGBT populations. Is that the same relationship we spoke of a moment ago? That's the same assumption, yes. Okay. And how do you connect that to reduced violence and intimidation of children based on sexual orientation? Uh, I believe that one aspect of that discrimination is the violence and intimidation that children experience at school. Could you take a look at the exhibit in your binder marked PX810, please? Do you recognize this document? Yes, I do. The a research brief you relied on in preparing your expert report in this case? Yes, it is. <coughs> Your Honor, I move PX810 into evidence. No objection. Very well. 810 is admitted. <clears throat> Dr. Egan, what does this brief tell us about the number of students in California schools who are bullied based on their sexual orientation? Uh, it states that over 200,000 students in California each year are bullied uh, based on their actual or perceived sexual orientation. Their relationship between that bullying and absenteeism in schools? Uh, the report says that there is. It, it, it uh, states that nearly 109,000 school absences at the middle and high school levels in California are due to harassment based on actual or perceived sexual orientation. Is there a link between that and school district revenue? Uh, yes, uh, one of the basis for school district funding in, in um, California is attendance, and to the extent that attendance is less than it would be due to excessive absences, school district funding is less than it otherwise would be. What is the total impact in California, if you know, of that absenteeism? The report states that it costs um, California school districts at least $39.9 million per year. Would any of that impact be felt in San Francisco? I would expect that some of that would be felt in San Francisco. You know how much? I don't have an estimate of how much, and this report does not break out San Francisco. And are there any other economic impacts that you could envision from pupil absenteeism due to bullying based on sexual orientation? Um, well, the ultimate economic value of education is the process of education, and that's compromised whenever there is undue absenteeism. So to the extent that excessive absences um, uh, reduce the quality of education that children receive, that would have long-term economic consequences. Let's talk about the response to bullying. To the extent that school districts respond to bullying, does that also expend resources? Uh, if, uh, that re if that requires staff time and so forth, yes, that's additional resources spent in policing that behavior. Yes, that would result in a cost. And uh, I want to talk about responding to other kinds of sexual orientation discrimination as well. Could you just take a look for me at exhibit numbers 672, PX 672, 673, 674, 675 and 676 in your binder, please. Yes. Um, these documents to which they refer appear to be hate crimes in California. And uh, Dr. Egan did not refer to hate crimes in his expert report. We did not have an opportunity to depose him on that matter. Um, these were not documents that were uh, relied upon by him. Um, so we would object to uh, testimony on hate crimes as beyond the scope of his expert report. Your Honor, Dr. Egan's report dealt generally with the fact of local governments and state governments responding to claims of di discrimination. These are simply examples, and I think the limited scope of questioning that, um, that I'll conduct on this is going to alleviate any concerns that Mr. Patterson has. Well, if the topic was covered in his report and in his deposition, I think it's appropriate for him to cover that topic generally in his testimony, but I don't know that that opens the door to the introduction of these particular documents into evidence. Your Honor, these documents were actually authenticated. Uh, they were 
Were they authenticated at his deposition? Not at his deposition. They were authenticated by the state, by the Attorney General in discovery subsequent to his deposition. Moreover, the 2008 hate crimes report was not released until late in 2008 after Dr. Egan's deposition had occurred. Well, that obviously would not apply to 673, 674, 675, um, I suppose. Are these the kinds of uh, documents of which the court can take judicial notice? These appear to be produced by the California Department of Justice. Yes, Your Honor, they were, and I believe that they are the kinds of documents of which the court can take judicial notice. Any reason the court cannot take judicial notice of these government documents, uh, Mr. Patterson? Uh, no, Your Honor, but to the extent um, Dr. Egan is going to testify about them, the, the term hate crimes did not appear in his expert report. We did not depose him about hate crimes. So we have not had an opportunity to prepare to uh, discuss that with Dr. Egan. To the extent Your Honor wants to take judicial notice of the documents, we do not. I misunderstand you, Ms. Van Aken. You say... Responding to... I didn't... No, responding to discrimination, Your Honor, uh, is responding to discrimination. It was the topic covered in the expert report, the cost of that. Uh, we did not specifically talk about hate crimes or hate crime reports. All right. Well, I think perhaps we should move on then. Okay. <clears throat> Your Honor, may I talk about the 2008 report, which was not in... Uh, had not been released well, by the Department it, it of Justice? Well, but it deals with the same subject, doesn't it? It does deal with the and, same subject, uh, Your Honor. I think Mr. Patterson is right. If you didn't cover the subject in um, either his report or in the deposition, uh, I don't think it's appropriate to open up a whole new subject. I will move on, Your Honor. Dr. Egan, let's talk about uh, whether you saw any relationship in your report on, um, sorry, when you were preparing your report and informing your opinions in this case, did you reach any opinions about the impacts of wedding-related activity on San Francisco's budget? Yes, I did. What is that opinion, Dr. Egan? Uh, in my opinion, if, um, if uh, same-sex marriages were legalized, uh, there would be more same-sex weddings in San Francisco, and consequently, that those weddings would generate economic activity that would lead to more sales tax revenue, hotel tax revenue for San Francisco. Dr. Egan, how many marriage licenses uh, were issued in San Francisco in 2008? You mean for same-sex marriages? Um, yes. Uh, that number I do vaguely remember. I believe it's around 5,100. And were some of those marriage licenses issued to couples from out of state? Yes. Were some of them issued to couples from other countries? I believe so, yes. And at the time that those marriage licenses were being issued, were weddings also taking place? Yes, they were. What was the effect of that activity on San Francisco's revenues? Um, that has weddings as a, as an exp uh, as a source of expenditure uh, have two kinds of, of basic effects on, on a local economy. There is the spending on the event and associated uh, consumer spending that leads to sales tax revenue. Weddings can also draw in guests from out of town uh, who stay in hotels and uh, generate business for the hotel industry. Is that activity that's been lost since same-sex marriage has been prohibited in San Francisco? Yes, it is. Let's talk about how that loss has come about and what you project if the prohibition were lifted. Um, can you just briefly describe for me the relationship between lifting that prohibition and then seeing additional sales tax or hotel tax revenue? Yes. If, we, uh, uh, if uh, the prohibition were lifted, we would see first more resident weddings, um, re weddings by same-sex couples who currently reside in San Francisco. Uh, and we have projected that additional spending to be about $21 million a year annually, uh, particularly when we include uh, there will also be non-residents who come to San Francisco to marry. They will also have event-related spending for their weddings, although a greatly reduced compared to residents. They will also generate per diem spending as visitors to the city. 
and they will generate hotel business because they'll be staying in hotels. The third set of uh, uh, new economic activity associated with, with would be out-of-town guests, which we are, have assumed uh, would largely come for resident weddings. They will generate per diem spending, and they will also help fill hotel rooms. So the combination of the event spending on the wedding itself and the per diem spending of visitors generates sales tax revenue. The additional hotel rooms generates hotel tax revenue. What's the magnitude of the effect of all of this in your estimate? The spending effect is on the order of $35 million. The um, uh, hotel room revenue is on the order of $2.5 million. And the uh, tax revenue we project at $1.7 million a year for sales tax and about $0.9 million a year for hotel tax. Speaking generally, what did you base these calculations on? Uh, we based it on the experience that San Francisco saw with same-sex weddings in 2008. The short-term or a long-term projection for annual increased revenue from sales and hotel taxes? Uh, I guess I would characterize it as a short-term projection. Uh, it's reasonable for me to think that uh, if same-sex marriage is legalized again, we will see a similar uh, level of activity that we saw the last time. I wouldn't expect that rate to continue forever, however. But continuing into the future, into the long term, do you expect some level of activity? Oh, certainly I would. Uh, even if every same-sex uh, couple who resides in San Francisco, for example, were able to get married and, and, and was married, uh, there are still new relationships developing, couples forming, uh, people moving to San Francisco who don't live here now. And so there will always be uh, uh, marriages going on into the future at some level, and therefore you would see some economic benefit. Okay. Let's turn now to federal income tax benefits um, with respect to city revenue that might result from the lifting of the prohibition on the marriage of same-sex couples. Do you see a relationship there? Yes, I do. And what is that relationship? Uh, if uh, marriage for same-sex couples were permitted, uh, that would affect their federal income tax burden in a way that would put uh, more revenue, would result in income tax savings for them. Uh, they would have, as a result, more money, mo some of which they would spend in San Francisco, and uh, that higher spending in San Francisco would generate more sales tax for the city and county. Are you assuming any changes to federal law? It's question was... Are you assuming any changes to federal law? It's my understanding that the Defense of Marriage Act would have to be changed in order to allow this. I see. For these couples to see this income tax benefit. Yes, that would be an additional requirement before this could benefit could be realized. What's the potential magnitude of this benefit to San Francisco? Um, to, to the best of my recollection, the average savings, some, some uh, same-sex couples would experience a income tax savings, and some would actually um, have a higher income tax burden if they were married. But the average works out to, I believe, $440 a year or so savings. And if that were multiplied by the uh, a reasonable estimate of the number of uh, same-sex married couples we might see in San Francisco, and they spent all of that in San Francisco on taxable goods, we would see as much as $74,000 a year in additional revenue. Would the state see any additional revenue? Yes, again, the state gets a, a larger percentage of sales tax than the city does, so they would see an increase in sales tax revenue as well. And assuming an effect like this, would this be true for other be federal benefits that same-sex couples could receive, such as Social Security, survivor, or disability benefits? Uh, to the extent that their benefits would increase uh, if they were married, then yes, they would have more revenue to spend in San Francisco, and the city would, would receive additional tax revenue. Dr. Egan, I want to turn now to talk about San Francisco's Equal Benefits Ordinance. Can you take a look at the exhibit marked PX811 for me, please? 811. Do you recognize this document? Uh, yes, I do. What is this? It is um, municipal code from San Francisco that details the Human Rights Commission in the city and its policies concerning discrimination. 
and Chapter 12B details the Equal Benefits Ordinance. Is this something that you reviewed in preparing your, in reaching opinions in this case? Yes, it is. Your Honor, I move PX0811 into evidence. Okay. 811 is in. Dr. Egan, does this, does the Equal Benefits Ordinance require the Human Rights Commission to investigate discrimination complaints? Yes, it does. And um, does the Human Rights Commission also have responsibilities with respect to San Francisco's contracting? Yes, it does. What are those responsibilities? In general, uh, it is um, the, the city's policy is to um, uh, regulate contracting in ways that do not promote discrimination and actively discourage discrimination. So what is your understanding of the, the goal or the intent of the Equal Benefits Ordinance? The Equal Benefits Ordinance is, is uh, intended, uh, intended to redress discrimination and discourage discrimination by requiring contractors for the city to provide the same benefits to domestic partners that they provide to married couples. Dr. Egan, does it, is it costly to the city to administer the Equal Benefits Ordinance in some way? Uh, I believe the, uh, the annual administrative cost is in the order of a million dollars a year for the city. To the extent that other governments investigate claims of discrimination, would they also incur costs? From our Equal Benefits Ordinance or in general? No, in general. Yes. And did the city incur costs in, in defending the Equal Benefits Ordinance from legal challenges? Uh, yes, the city did. Dr. Egan, I want to turn to the issue of the city's contracting costs. Under the Equal Benefits Ordinance, do you see any relationship between um, combating discrimination, as you told me, as the purpose of the Equal Benefits Ordinance, and San Francisco's contracting costs? Yes, I do. What is that relationship, Dr. Egan? Uh, I believe that if same-sex marriage were legalized, uh, the city would receive, uh, would see reduced contracting costs and lower bids on many of its RFPs and proposals. Tell me how that would work. Uh, yes. Uh, I believe that if same-sex marriage were legalized, uh, more companies would extend benefits to same-sex couples who were married. Uh, this would lead companies to perceive or experience an actual uh, a lower compliance cost to San Francisco's EBO uh, since they are already providing the benefits to married couples. Uh, it would be easier for them to comply with the Equal Benefits Ordinance. If that were the case, I would expect that some companies who are either not eligible to contract with the city or who are deterred from bidding with the city because they perceive the EBO as a deterrent would no longer uh, experience that deterrent and consequently we would see an expand, um, expanded competition among contractors for doing business with the city. Do you currently believe that there is a reduced pool of contractors competing for the city's business because of the EBO? Well, to the extent that it's a deterrent, yes. And what would be the result of this increased response and competition that you've described? Some of the companies that are either not eligible or are deterred may very well be the lowest bidder or the preferred bidder. And consequently, that tends to inflate the city's contracting costs. I see. Can you quantify what the magnitude of this inflation is presently? Well, it's very difficult to know what the bids of the companies who are deterred from bidding would be. Uh, so I can't provide a quantitative estimate of that. But it's, it's sort of basic economics that the more competitors you have, the more price pressure you have. What's the potential impact of lowered contracting costs for the city if the EBO is perceived to be easier to comply with? Um, are you asking for a quantitative estimate of savings? Yeah, at least potentially. Well, uh, contracting costs are a significant expense for the city, over $2 billion a year. So even a very small reduction in costs due to a regulatory change regarding how easy it is to contract with the city could result in a significant savings. Uh, a 1 percent savings, for example, would result in a 21, 1 percent reduction in cost would result in a $21 million savings for the city. Is that an annual figure? Yes, it is. 
And assume with me that there is no further discrimination based on sexual orientation in marriage, and assume with me that the San Francisco Board of Supervisors thereafter repeals the Equal Benefits Ordinance. What would then be the contracting cost to San Francisco from the Equal Benefits Ordinance? Well, in that case, it would be none. Not so. Um, Dr. Egan, I want to show you a last slide, um, that, a last demonstrative uh, that's entitled Summary of Impacts, Quantifiable and Non-Quantifiable, and ask you if that reflects an accurate summary of the opinions that you've rendered in this case. Yes, it is. And uh, what is the import of this distinction between quantitative and non-quantitative, or uh, quantifiable and non-quantifiable? I think the importance of, of the quantifiable impacts to discuss them first. Uh, is that um, by the um, usual methods that we would do in the Office of Economic Analysis, uh, it's clear to me that um, Proposition 8 has a negative material economic impact on San Francisco. That is to say, the city is losing uh, more than $10 million a year in economic activity. And as I've quantified it here, it's at least $2.6 million simply from hotel and sales tax revenue that we're not getting from same-sex weddings. Um, and so the import is, although there are many, many impacts, uh, we can quantify impacts that would, if it were local legislation, lead me to think it was had a material economic impact. Just so I understand that calculation, I'm sorry. So I understand what you just said. It, there's a total level of economic activity that must occur for it to be material. Is that right? That's right. Not necessarily a total revenue effect. That's right, although the large economic activity leads to a large, relatively large revenue impact. I see, I see. So when you were speaking earlier about the, the 35 million for wedding-related activity, for instance, is that material in your opinion? Yes, that exceeds $10 million. And now tell me about this, um, this distinction, the non-quantifiable piece. Most of the impacts that I uh, detailed in my report are not quantifiable, uh, or at least not as readily quantifiable as the ones on the left. Uh, but I wouldn't want to minimize their impact or suggest that they were small, particularly in the long term. What we're really talking about in the non-quantifiable impacts are the long-term advantages of marriage as, a, as an institution and the long-term costs of discrimination uh, as uh, uh, a way that weakens people's productivity and integration into the labor force, whether it's weakening their education because they're discriminated against at school, um, or uh, we, um, uh, leading them to excessive reliance on behavioral and other health services. Um, uh, these are impacts that uh, are hard to quantify, but they can wind up being extremely powerful. How much healthier you are over your lifetime, how much wealth you generate because you're in a partnership. And so it, it seems reasonable to me to think that in the long term, these are the impacts that would matter for San Francisco, even if we can't attach a number to them now. Good. Nothing further. Very well, Mr. Pedersen, you may cross examine. <clears throat> Your Honor, maybe we approach the witness with exhibit exhibit binder, please. That would be fine. Good morning, Dr. Egan. Good morning. Um, my name is Peter A. Patterson. I'll be asking you some questions on behalf of the, the intervener. Um, and first, I'd like to start with the uh, 
economic activity that you believe will be generated in San Francisco on account of same-sex marriages being allowed. And you had testified that uh, San Francisco currently incurs costs because these, uh, in the forms of foregone sales tax and hotel tax revenues on account of same-sex couples not being able to get married. Is that correct? That's correct. You have attempted to estimate, at least for the short term, um, the new consumer spending that would generate these revenues that same-sex marriage would uh, gener generate on an annualized basis in the city and county of San Francisco. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Um, you, you have not attempted to quantify the long-term impact. Is that correct? That's correct. And you've not attempted to quantify the impact of domestic partnerships on San Francisco's economy. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And Dr. Egan, um, are you aware if uh, gays and lesbians may currently have religious or other wedding ceremonies and celebrations, even though they're not permitted to obtain a civil marriage license? Uh, I'm actually not aware of that. I, I don't know. Do you think it's reasonable to assume that that they do? That they are allowed to have religious... That they are permitted to have religious wedding ceremonies, even though they are not permitted to obtain a civil marriage license? I guess I would assume that's reasonable, yes. And is it reasonable to assume that some of them actually do have those types of ceremonies and celebrations? I would... I guess so, yes. But you have, you have not accounted for any e economic impact that's generated from those currently, have you? Um, that's correct. Uh, I suppose one reason might be I don't have a count of them, whereas I, I have a right. count of legal marriages. And do you know if gays and lesbians that have such celebrations, were they permitted to civilly marry, would they have another one? Difficult for me to put myself in their shoes there. Right. So, so your report essentially assumes that every gay and lesbian couple that gets married will have a uh, wedding ceremony or celebration. Is that correct? I actually, um, the analysis depends that there is an average expenditure on weddings associated with each uh, wedding. Yes. That implicitly assumes every uh, each of them has. No, it assumes wedding. that on average this is the average expenditure. It doesn't assume everyone hits exactly the average. But it is okay. Um, now you have based your short-term estimate on San Francisco's experience from June 17, 2008, to November 4, 2008. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and. You implicitly assume that the same number of same-sex couples will get married, uh, at least in the short term, at a similar rate as they did during that time period. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and you recognize that the rate that occurred during that time period was uh, partially due to a pent-up demand for same-sex marriage. Is that correct? Uh, in the sense that there were a number of same-sex couples who were unable to be married and wanted to be married quickly, yes, that's correct. And that means that, that the rate that occurred during that time frame was inflated to some extent or due to that pent-up demand, is that correct? I inflated, you mean relative to some future rate? Yes. Yes, that's right. But you believe that the, that pent-up demand was not satisfied during that time period in 2008. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, well, uh, the um, I'm simply assuming that there will be the same rate of marriage if it's legalized again. Yes. So, so that to means the pent-up demand was not satisfied. Is that to correct? the extent that that inc includes pent-up demand, yes, you are correct. <laughs> Your assumption that there is a pent-up demand on same-sex marriage uh, is based simply on your opinion living in the city and observing the interest in it among same-sex couples. Is that correct? I didn't use I, I didn't use a concept of pent-up demand in my analysis. I simply said when same-sex 
if same-sex marriage, marriage is legalized again, it's reasonable to me to assume you would see the same level of activity that you did um, when it was last legal. Uh, I, I believe you testified a little differently at your deposition. Um, if, if you could turn to tab two in the binder um, on page 29, starting at line 24, or excuse me, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, starting at line 24. And the question is, so what is your basis for thinking there is a pent up demand for same sex marriage? Um, and then if you go down to line nine on the following page, uh, you testified, I simply thought it was reasonable to presume there was a pent up demand for same sex marriages in San Francisco just from living in the city and observing the interest in it among many same sex couples. Did you give that testimony at your deposition? Well, those are my words. I'm trying to reconstruct the context. Uh, yes or no, did you? Yes. Okay. And your basis for assuming that this pent-up demand was not satisfied from June 17, 2008 to November 4, 2008, is that to the best of your recollection, there were pending marriage appointments in the county clerk's office that were scheduled after November 4, 2008. Is that correct? Yes, that's one reason. Okay. Um, if you could please turn your attention to tab 22 in the witness binder. This is an exhibit that has been marked PX805, Plaintiff's Exhibit, Plaintiff's exhibit 805. Do you recognize this document? Yes, I do. Um, and what is this document? This is a uh, summary of uh, marriage license appointments uh, and actual marriage license issued by the San Francisco County Clerk. Your Honor, we move this PX805 into evidence. 805 is admitted. Um, now, Dr. Egan, from June 17th, 2006 to June 30th, or 2008, I'm sorry, to June 30th, 2008. How many uh, marriage license appointments for same-sex couples does this document report? Uh, 1,080. But from July 1st to July 31st? 897. August 1st to August 31st? 836. Uh, September 1st. To September I think we 30th. can read, okay. read these numbers. Let's go to the question. Okay. So the question is, how about from November 5th to November 30th? Uh, 56. Uh, and that's quite a bit lower than the number of marriage appointments uh, that were pending during the time same-sex marriage was legal. Is that correct? I think you can ask the witness whether he sees a trend. <laughs> uh, it's a lower number. Um, my, the only reason I hesitate in giving that answer is this is uh, as of November 24th. Um, and I don't know how many people canceled their appointment between November 5th and November 24th when this document was prepared. Okay, well, with this particular document doesn't provide much evidence that the pent up demand was similar after it was not satisfied. Uh, during the um, time same-sex marriage was legal, does it? Um, if you're asking me to believe that there was a great deal of pent-up demand from October 20th to November 4th when there were a thousand appointments, but somehow it ended right uh, at that point and there was no pent-up demand from uh, as of November 5th, I would just say this is not an indicator of pent-up demand. It's well, you, you gave as your testimony, did you not, that the pending marriage appointment, license appointments were an indicator that pent-up demand was not satisfied. Is that correct? The fact that anyone had an appointment to get married after November 4th indicates that there are at least some couples 
who wish to get married. I would not say that that is an exhaustive list. Right, but you distinguish between pent-up demand and some sort of demand that would obtain in the long term. Is that correct? Pent-up demand is not a concept that I used in my analysis. I'm simply saying that in the short term, if same-sex marriage were legal again, we would see a similar experience to what we saw in 2008. Right, but what you have said is you would expect that for a period of time, the marriage rate would be elevated, and in the longer term, it would go to some some more steady state level. Is that correct? That's correct. That's a good way to put it. Um, and as evidence that this, uh, the rate would continue at the rate it did before November 4th, 2008, you gave that there were marriage license appointments pending. Is that correct? That is one indicator, yes. Right. Now, this does not support uh, an assertion that uh, marriage appointments would continue at a similar rate after November 4th, 2008 than it did before, does it? Well, it doesn't if, if you believe that this was 100% uh, of the pent-up demand. Uh, do, could you clarify it, please? Yes. I mean, uh, it seems to me that suppose you were, a same, you were in a same-sex relationship and you wanted to get married after November 5th, um, you would be classified as the way we've been talking about it as pent-up demand. That doesn't lead me to think you would go to the county clerk and make an appointment. So this list of, of outstanding county clerk appointments indicates that there are at least some couples who wish to get married, but it doesn't, you wouldn't think that every couple that wished to get married would make an appointment for something that couldn't happen. But it doesn't indicate that couples would get married at the same rate after November 4th as they did before, does it? I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? It, it indicates that some same-sex couples would get married after November 4th, and I'm not questioning that at all. I, I assume same-sex couples would if they were printed to marry. Okay. But it doesn't indicate they would get married at the same rate as they would, as they did before November 4th, 2008, does it? But it's not an indicator of those who will get married or want to get married. Okay. It's simply evidence of some. Okay. In other words, the... the, the, the um, Marriage licenses, when it's legal, are a, because you're able to get married, are a fairly accurate measure of the demand for marriage. The number after you can't get married are not. That's, I, I think that's be the important distinction. Well, right, and I'm asking you what you based your opinion on that the number after November 4th, 2008, would be comparable to that before. And this is one of the indicators that you gave me. Is that correct? That's correct, and it, it is an indication that there are some people who even after Proposition 8 passed had existing marriage license appointments. Okay. Uh, and, and if I could give you a slightly deeper answer, it's the only actual quantitative information that I could have given you in response to your question at the deposition. I don't know how many same-sex couples in San Francisco want to get married now because I have no, there's no way to register that. Fair enough. Um, now... As we've been discussing here, we've been calling pent-up demand uh, or this elevated rate of marriages that will obtain for the short term. Um, you believe that this will uh, last for several years, is that correct? I, I used the term several years in my uh, expert report, yes. Uh, but you cannot quantify it beyond the term several years, is that correct? Right, because I don't have a clear sense of what's pent-up demand and what is the factors that go into what you term the steady state rate. Um, and you can't even say it would be less than 10 years, is that correct? That's, I, I cannot put a number to it, yes. Okay. You can't say it would be less than 20 years? That's correct. Uh, please turn to uh, tab 3 in the witness binder. This is a document that's been marked Plaintiff's Exhibit 815, PX 815. Um, and do you recognize this document? Yes, I do. Um, what is this document? This is a uh, uh, report that I prepared in 2008 at the request of a member of our Board of Supervisors to estimate what the uh, three-year impact of legalizing same-sex marriage might be on San Francisco's economy. Uh, Your Honor, we'd like to admit this evidence. 815 is admitted. Um, you said this was done at the request of a member of the uh, Board of Supervisors. Is that correct? That's correct. 
because uh, uh, your office typically does not review statewide uh, legislation. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. Um, and you believe that the board of supervisors, the board of supervisors member who requested this, was uh, wanted to know if the revenues of same-sex marriage would offset the cost of same-sex marriage. Is that correct? Um, I believe the request wanted to know the revenue impacts to um, look at whether it made sense to add additional resources for the county clerk who had to process an elevated number of license and appointment requests. So they thought they might have some additional staffing costs associated right. with same-sex marriage. Okay. Um, so now if you can turn to uh, page six of this report. And this is a slide uh, titled Assumptions San Francisco Resident Weddings. Resident Weddings. And can you please read uh, the first sentence of the first bullet point on that page? Yes, it says, based on the experience of Massachusetts, we project that 28% of San Francisco's same-sex couples will marry in fiscal year 2008-09 and 9% in fiscal year 2009-10, a 67% drop. Okay, what I'm interested in is this 67% uh, drop in same-sex marriages that you assumed from the first year to the second year of its availability. Um, for your opinion, in this case, you have not factored in any drop from the uh, time period in 2008 when same-sex marriage was legal until uh, the time when uh, same-sex marriage is permitted again. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, and you've not you've said that uh, rate that obtained in 2008 would last for several years, and you've not project, projected any uh, any drop um, between those years. Is that correct? That's right. I've not attempted to quantify that drop. Um, in this report, which you did for a uh, member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, you did you did a projected drop. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, so now, if you could turn to uh, tab four in the witness binder. And this is a document that's been marked uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 1734. Uh, can you identify this document? And if you would like at the same time to look at what has been uh, behind tab five, that is PX 1735, um, I, I believe those two documents taken together represent all the marriages that took place in San Francisco uh, during the time period same-sex marriage was legal. I right? believe you're correct. Okay, and Your Honor, we'd like to admit these two, move these two documents, PX 1734, PX 1735, into evidence. No objection. Perhaps you can have the witness explain uh, how one should read these. Yes, yeah. I was the information prepared content. to Maybe walk through. Plenty to do that, Mr. Patterson. Yes. All right. Fine. Okay. Um, so this is information the county clerk's office provided you. Uh, with respect to marriages in San Francisco, is that correct? And it's my understanding that there's an entry uh, in these documents for each marriage that took place in San Francisco from uh, June 17th, 2008 to November 4th, 2008, is that correct? That's my understanding too. Um, and it's broken down, uh, well, first of all, there are two documents. Uh, and my understanding is that one of them is confidential weddings, and one of them is weddings that are on the public record. Is that correct? That's why there are two documents, yes. Okay. Um, and the information in each of these documents, the weddings are broken down uh, between San Francisco resident weddings, San Francisco resident same-sex couples, um, non-San Francisco resident same-sex couples, and then opposite-sex couples. Is that correct? And if I'd have to refresh my recollection about the ordering. Okay. But um, well, if it would help you refre reflect your recollection, if you look at PX 1735, um, if that one has page numbers on it, so it's a little easier for me to ask you to flip through that one. And that's behind tab five. Uh, and then on 
page 42 of that. Yes. It says same sex inside San Francisco. Is that correct? It's yes. cut off, but that's what yes. you understand. That it means. Mm -hmm. And so everything above that would be uh, same sex marriages that occurred inside San Francisco. Is that correct? And if you turn to page 90, about a third of the way down the page, uh, do you understand that that represents uh, same sex outside of San Francisco? Yes. Okay. And then if you turn to page 142, which I believe is the last page of the document, um, it says opposite sex. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And is it your understanding that the other document has these listed in the same in the same order? And this one doesn't have page numbers, but it's about, you know, the, on the fifth page is where the first cutoff takes place. It's organized in the same way. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, and for each wedding, would you agree that it includes the uh, city and state of residence for each partner to the marriage? Yes. Each partner to the marriage. And so with these documents, you could determine the portion of out-of-state couples that came to California to get married during this time period, is that correct? Yes. Or came to San Francisco, I'm sorry. Um, and, uh, but you have not attempted to do so in this report, is that correct? Uh, I believe the distinction we made in our analysis is resident, non-resident, and not in-state, out-of-state. Yes. Okay. Now, if you could turn to, uh, to tab six, a little bit in this binder. And this is a document that's been marked PX 1736. And this is uh, data. Uh, first of all, can you identify this document? Yes, this is a summary of the um, reports we were just examining that okay. summarizes them by the whether it's an opposite sex or same sex marriage and the location of the part, the residence of the partners. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, we would admit, move to admit PX 1736. Very well. 1736 is admitted. <clears throat> now let's start with uh, San Francisco resident, same-sex marriages. So from June, 4, June 17th to November 4th, 2008, there were 2,331 uh, San Francisco resident same-sex marriages. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and your annualized calculations are based on uh, basically dividing the activity that took place during this time period by 0.38 to arrive at an annualized figure. Is that correct? Right, because the period during in 2008 that same-sex marriage was legal represents 38% of 2008. Okay. Uh, and Your Honor, I would like to uh, use a demonstrative to ask next several well. questions. So this is the, the first slide, and we just established that 2,331 same-sex marriages between San Francisco residents took place in uh, 2008. Is that correct? Yes, we just did. And that using your methodology, you'd have to divide by uh, 0.38 to get the annualized figure. Is that correct? So can we move to slide two, please. So I've done the math here, 2,331 divided by, oh, sorry, apologize. 2,331 divided by 0.38 equals 6,134. Does that look right to you? That, I trust your math on that. Okay. Um, and you've said that uh, marriages would con continue at this rate for several years. So I'm going to assume that's, you know, several would be at least two. Is that correct? Again, I can't attach a number to it because right. I don't have a sense of what the... But several generally is more than one, is that correct? It's more than one. Okay. Um, so then after two years, using your methodology, you would project that in addition to the 2,331 San Francisco uh, couples that got married in 2008, there would be 6,134 times two. Is that correct? Yes. 
So can we move to the next slide? So that would be after after two years of uh, if same-sex marriage were legalized again, we'd have 14,599 uh, San Francisco resident same-sex marriages. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if you could please turn to tab seven in your witness binder. This is a uh, document that's been marked Plaintiff's Exhibit 817. Do you recognize this document? Yes, I do. Um, and could you uh, describe what the document is? Uh, yeah, this is a, um, a table from the U.S. Census Bureau's American Community Survey. And you relied on this table in preparing your expert report? Yes, I did. Uh, Your Honor, we'd like to move this uh, PX 817 into evidence. No objection. 817 is admitted. <clears throat> now, could you tell me how many uh, male couple households uh, this Census Bureau report uh, estimates there are in San Francisco? Do you mean uh, unmarried partner households where there's a male householder and male partner? Yes, I do. That's 7,033. Um, and could you tell me how many female households of similar type there it reports? Uh, that's 2,591. Let's say, uh, I'll represent you, that's a total of 9,624. Does that sound correct? Now, do you... Uh, yes, I'm sorry. So you understand this to be estimated that there are 9,624 same-sex couples living in San Francisco, is that correct? There were on an average during the three years that were covered by the census, yes. And in light of that, do you think it's reasonable to assume that after uh, two more years of same-sex marriage, there would be 14,599 uh, San Francisco resident same-sex couples that get married in San Francisco? Well, I wouldn't be able to comment on the reasonableness of that unless I knew something about the migration rate in and out of San Francisco of gay and lesbian individuals, and I knew something about the rate of couple formation. If, for example, these 9,000 or so uh, have um, either gotten married and are no longer unmarried or have moved out of San Francisco uh, or their partnerships have dissolved, there could very well be, over the next two years, an additional 14,000 new um, uh, uh, set of couples that might wish to get married. Again, I, this is one reason why I didn't attach a number of years to it, because I don't have that necessary information to make a long-term calculation. Okay. Do uh, you think it would have been, you know, informative to compare uh, the number of marriages your estimate projects with the population of same-sex couples in San Francisco? I think if I had wanted to quantify the length of time that I thought that short-term projection would apply, uh, well, actually, no, um, because I'm not sure. I think by itself, this is not a good predictor of the number of weddings in San Francisco, because you need to know how many couples there are in a given year who are ready to get married, and that has to do with the dynamics of migration, the dynamics of household formation or couple formation. Um, well, can I ask you to look at... Uh, tab 8 in the witness binder now, please. This is an exhibit that's been marked PX 818, uh, the impact of extending marriage to same-sex couples on the California budget. Um, so Williams Institute report, do you recognize this document? A Williams Institute report, do you recognize this document? Yes, I do. Uh, and did you rely on this document in preparing your expert opinion in this case? Yes, I did. Um, now, if you would turn to um, page four, and the second sentence of the uh, of the second paragraph says that approximately 9,695 same-sex couples married in Massachusetts during the first three years they were allowed to do so, constituting at least 44 percent of Massachusetts same-sex couples as counted in the U.S. Census Bureau's American Community Survey. Is that correct? Yes, it is. And is it correct that your projection assumes that over 100% of San, San Francisco's same-sex couples, as counted by the U.S. Census Bureau's American Community Survey, would get married after two years uh, 
were San Francisco were same sex marriage permitted? Well, the Census Bureau doesn't count the number of couples at a over a two year period. It counts the number of couples at one point in time right. uh, and reports it for that year. But I'm this Williams Institute report yes. used the U.S. Census Bureau's American Community Survey to determine what percentage of Massachusetts same-sex couples got married during the first three years they were allowed to do so. Is that correct? Right. And that is the same methodology I just walked you through with respect to your projections. Is that correct? So with respect to... Objection overruled. <clears throat> Which methodology are you referring to? Uh, the methodology of seeing how many weddings your, uh, your methodology would assume occur in San Francisco during the next two years was the, the um, period that I selected. And then using the U.S. Census Bureau's American Community Survey estimates as basically a denominator to figure out the percentage of same-sex couples that that represents. Is that, is, is that what the Williams Institute did? And is that the same thing I've walked you through? The Williams Institute has uh, compared the number of um, same-sex couples who were married in Massachusetts during the first three years that they were allowed to do so with an estimate of the total number of same-sex couples in Massachusetts as reported by the American Community Survey. And you have um, extrapolated my estimate to produce a two-year estimate and compared it to the American Community Survey for San Francisco's estimate of same-sex couples. And what actually happened in Massachusetts after three years was 44% of same-sex couples got married. Is that correct? As, as so estimated? Yes, I believe that's correct. And your projections... Uh, assume that over 100% of San Francisco same-sex couples would get married. Is that correct? Um, By those same, using those same parameters. Again, I don't believe that um, that is a correct measure necessarily of the of the um, uh, number of potential <laughs> weddings that could take place because of the issue of how couple formation and migration that I have discussed. I'm not asking you if it's a correct. Uh, way to analyze. I'm asking you if, if that is the result of that analysis, that over 100% as counted that way. Yes. Okay. Um, now, you claim that revenue will be generated from the marriages of same-sex resident, same-sex couples in the form of hotel tax revenues and sales tax res revenues. Is that correct? Yes. Hotel tax revenues are generated when non-resident guests, same-sex couples, travel to San Francisco to attend weddings. Is that correct? As well as when uh, non-resident couples travel to San Francisco to marry. Right. I'd like to just now focus on the San Francisco resident same-sex weddings for this series of questions. Um, and sales tax will be generated by the per diem spending of these out-of-town guests. Is that correct? Yes. And sales tax will also be generated by retail expenditures the couples make on their weddings. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, so you assume that out-of-town guests will attend weddings of San Francisco resident same-sex couples. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and you haven't attempted to determine how many out-of-town guests actually attended uh, such weddings in 2008, have you? Um, you haven't attempted to determine how many of those guests actually stayed at hotels, is that correct? No, I, I would have no way to, to imagine that information was obtainable. Okay. Um, so you simply picked a, a number to, to estimate that figure, is that correct? Well, as you do when you make economic projections, we made some very conservative assumptions about the relative size of same-sex weddings and the number of guests who might stay from out of town. We, we assumed only 10% of wedding guests would come from out of town, which seemed to me to be a fairly conservative assumption. Okay. Um, and with respect to wedding expenditures by San Francisco same-sex couples, 
you assume that uh, the average taxable cost of the wedding of a resident same-sex couple is 25% of that of the wedding of an opposite-sex couple. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and you have not studied the actual expenditures of same-sex couples on their weddings either. Is that correct? No, we actually relied on the Williams Institute report that we've been referring to for that assumption. Okay. Um, now, if you could please turn back to uh, tab three in the witness binder. This is the Office of Economic Analysis report that we discussed earlier um, that you put together. If you could turn to page six, please. It's the same slide we looked at before. Um, if you could read the first sentence of the third bullet point. They will spend an average of 25% of what different sex weddings cost in San Francisco, or $9,180 per wedding. And by they, you mean same-sex couples? Resident same-sex couples, that's correct. And if you could read the second sentence of that, please. The second sentence says, however, only 10% of this is assumed to count as new income for figuring an economic impact. Uh, and continue with the third sentence, please. Most resident spending will simply be diverted from other expenditures and will not create a net economic impact. You haven't made a similar assumption in this case, have you? That's correct. You, your calculations assume that 100% of the expenditures same se San Francisco same-sex couples make on their weddings will constitute new spending. Is that correct? Well, technically, I'm assuming that the 25% uh, cost represents the new income uh, that is generated. So reflected in the fact that um, the same-sex marriage impact number is less than a, um, the cost of a, an average opposite sex wedding uh, is considering that which is new income. And that's following the assumption made in the Williams Institute report correctly. Okay, but for the report that you did, uh, as part of your official duties as, uh, in the Office of Economic Analysis, you assume that only 10% of the 25% would constitute new spending. Is that correct? That's correct. I believe I misunderstood how the Williams Institute had made that assumption in their report. Okay. Well, fair enough. Um, so we've been discussing uh, San Francisco resident weddings. Let's now turn to uh, out-of-state weddings. And if you could uh, return to tab six of the witness binder. And this reports that uh, there were 2,821 non-San Francisco resident same-sex marriages that took place in 2008. Is that correct? Between yes. same-sex couples. Yes. Okay. Um, some of these were from out of in Cal within California, but out of San Francisco, and some were from out of the state and even in different countries. Is that correct? Yes. You have not distinguished between any of those categories. Is that correct? That's right. Um, now, do you know, since November 4th, 2008, have there been any additional jurisdictions that have permitted same-sex couples to get married? I don't recall the details on that, no. Since what date? Any additional jurisdictions? <coughs> no, the date. Excuse me? The date. Oh, November 4th, 2008. Yeah. Um, I will rep represent to you that there are a number of jurisdictions that have permitted same-sex couples to get married after uh, November 4th, 2008. Um, during that time period, Massachusetts had allowed out-of-state couples to get married for a short period of time. Um, that was the only other jurisdiction. And now I believe four other jurisdictions permit same-sex couples to be married. Uh, do you think those types of changes could have an impact on the number of out-of-state same-sex couples that come to California, and San Francisco in particular, to get married? Um, it might have an impact, although um, among the uh, locations from which people um, traveled to San Francisco to marry were places where uh, that were quite adjacent to, or in some cases perhaps even in, jurisdictions where they could already marry. San Francisco is a tourism destination as well as uh, a place to get married, and I'm, cer I'm certain that many out-of-state couples came to San Francisco for the tourism dimension 
and that would probably continue. Your report assumes that uh, such changes would have no effect. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Uh, but now, there, there, you know, there are there are many other potential changes that could affect that number that also don't go in there. There may be more same-sex couples forming in other states. There may be more couples wishing to get married. Uh, I don't I don't consider that either. It's a fairly simple methodology, actually. Okay, and now I'm going to ask you a hypothetical uh, or pose a hypothetical scenario to you, and that is assume that uh, same-sex marriage was legal in all 50 states. In that scenario. Uh, would you expect the percentage of out-of-state couples coming to California to get married to decrease from what we saw in 2008? To California or to San Francisco? San Francisco. I am not sure that that would necessarily reduce the number. I, I can see your point, but I would say that it depends on the number of same-sex couples wishing to get married across the U.S., and I don't know that that's a fixed number. Uh, but you, as you stated, you've you've not taken any of that into account. That's correct. Okay. Um, if you could please go back to tab three in the witness binder. Uh, again, the Office of Economic Analysis report that you put together. Um, and this time I want to ask you to turn to the seventh page. And this is... Um, assumptions that your office made about out-of-state resident weddings. And in the first bullet point, you state that uh, you project that the second year total will be 67 percent less than the first year total. Is that yes. correct? That's correct. And that's the same as you did for the inside San Francisco weddings in, this re in uh, the report you did uh, for the Board of Supervisors, is that correct? Yes. And similarly, similarly, you have not done that in your report for this court, is that correct? And not done what? You have not assumed that there will be a year-to-year -year decrease in the, uh, in the rate of same-sex couples getting married. That's correct. And 67% you know, is actually a fairly large decrease from year to year, is that, is that correct? Well, I was following in this 2008 report the, the methodology of the Williams Institute uh, as closely as I could. Um, the reason I did not follow that methodology for my expert report for this case was that that methodology from the 2008 report substantially underestimated the number of same-sex marriages that we actually had. So rather than attempt to replicate that methodology, uh, which had undercounted uh, what we had, I felt it would be more straightforward to simply extrapolate San Francisco's experience during a multi-month period of time. Now, same-sex marriage was not legal in San Francisco for a multi-year period of time. Is that correct? That's right. So, you, so there wasn't really evidence to disc to deviate from a one year to the next uh, estimate of what would happen. Is that correct? Right. That's based on the Williams Institute report, which does look at multi-year experience within Massachusetts. Um, Your Honor, I'd like to just request a, a brief break. If that How much longer do you have with this witness? Uh, I would say I'm about halfway through, Your Honor. Okay. Well, maybe a break will. Okay. Like your uh, colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Thompson, will reduce in reduce the length somewhat. Okay. That I'm sure would be helpful to everybody. All right. Uh, shall we take until uh, 15 minutes of the hour or uh, 10.45? Your Honor, Your Honor may I, just before we break, may I ask uh, one minor housekeeping matter? And yes. Point of clarification, actually, and it's further to your announcement as we uh, opened the court day that uh, the court was asking for withdrawal of this case from the pilot program. Uh, I, I just asked the court for clarification if I may then understand that the recording of these proceedings has been halted, the tape recording itself. No, that has not been altered. No, oh, this is, as the court knows, uh, I'm sure, uh, we, we have uh, uh, put in a letter to the court uh, asking that the recording of the proceedings be halted. I, I do believe that in the light of the stay that the court's local rule uh, would prohibit continued 
tape recording of the proceedings? I don't believe so. <clears throat> I read your letter. It uh, does not uh, quote the local rule. The local rule, let's see, I had that a moment ago. The local rule permits um, remote Perhaps if we get the uh, local rule uh, before no, me, no, I, 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 I can. Ah, okay. There we go. <clears throat> the local rule permits uh, the recording for uh, purposes of the uh, of um, taking the uh, recording for purposes of use in chambers, and that is customarily done when we have these remote courtrooms or the overflow courtrooms. And I think it would be quite helpful to me in preparing the findings of fact to uh, have that recording. Your Honor, so, it's so that's the purpose for which uh, the recording is uh, going to be made going forward, but it's not going to be for purposes of um, public broadcasting or televising. And you will notice the local rule states that the taking of photographs, public broadcasting, or televising, or recording for those purposes. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the recording is not being made for those purposes, but simply for use in chambers. Very well, Your Honor, and I, I appreciate that clarification. All right. 